On the workbench today is this HO Scale Alco 430 diesel by Gilbert. So this was made sometime in the 1950s, and I picked this up at a train show a while back. From what I was told, this has been through a flood. It's apparently in working condition, but um, I'll see for myself about that later. So I wanted to see what I could do to restore this and turn it into as good of a working model as it can be. So... Let's get to it. In the model train market, Gilbert was best known for being the owner of American Flyer during the time that they made O27 and S gauge trains. But in 1955, they decided to introduce an HO scale line under their own name, starting with a couple steam engines. In 1956, they started bringing in some diesels with an F3 made by Varney as well as the DL600, which I believe was also made with some assistance from Varney. When they brought this out, it was offered in train sets, as well as on its own, and only in the Alco demonstrator paint scheme. And it was offered for $25, or in 2024, that's about $285, so this was not a cheap model at all. And it did have some nice features for the time, as well as the advantage that it was fully assembled straight out of the box, which at the time, a lot of models were still kits. Now you'll notice in the original catalog appearance that they had quite a bit of hope for this being a popular diesel engine on major railroads, but unfortunately, only two examples of the DL600 were ever built, and they were only ever painted as demonstrators, and even the production DL600A, also known as the RSD7, only had a total of 27 units built. Now by 1958, the price of the individual engine had increased to 2750 or about $295 today. But sales of Gilbert HO trains were pretty poor, so in 1959, they started using the American Flyer name to try and get some extra sales back. They also lowered the prices with the DL600 now being $2250, or about $240 in today's dollars. They also introduced the Chesapeake and Ohio paint scheme, which I believe was never offered outside of train sets, so the individual models were only ever available as the Alco demonstrators as far as I know. Production of the model, as well as the rest of the H.O. Gilbert line, ended in 1961 with the death of A.C. Gilbert. Now, of course, to start off, the first thing I'm going to do is remove the shell. And see, looking around, I see a tab back here and a screw in the front. So I'm assuming that this is what's holding it on. So if I take this out, I think I'll be able to lift it up and off from the back. Yep, there it goes. So that was easy. The frame is made of metal. Yeah, light bulbs at both ends. And an open frame motor with a piece of tape or something on it. This doesn't look like window material, I don't think. Universals just drop out. Yeah, I don't think that's window material. That's just uh, some old tape or film or something that was used in there. So I'll just throw it away. All right. Well, it feels like the gear tower is turning smoothly, which is good. Then the trucks. Okay, they're also turning. I feel quite a bit of resistance in there, so this has some old grease in there that needs to be cleaned out. And the other one seems to be the same way. Stiff, but turning. So hopefully it won't be too hard to get this working. Wiring is all old style cloth wrapped stuff. Looks like it's in good shape, so I think I'll be able to keep that in there. No need to replace wire that's still good. All right, 
So let's uh, just get this apart the rest of the way. Let's see, I think that wire is soldered to the top of a screw, maybe. Hmm. Now, how's this truck held together? See, the center of the truck is metal, as well as that bottom plate. Side frames are plastic. I don't see any screws around it, though, or anything that allow me to take it apart. Ah, looks like the wheels have wipers, so that gives it a little bit of additional electrical pickup, but I'm assuming that the wheels are also grounded to the truck itself. And let's see. I think the rear truck is grounded to the frame, possibly, while the front is insulated. Gearbox is held in by one screw, and the motor by one more. Yeah, so that comes out easily enough. Of course, the wires are soldered onto there. But if the motor works, I don't think I'll really have to take that apart or unsolder it. I just want to get to this gearbox. Okay. So I guess I don't need to take the motor out to get the gearbox out. How is this put together? This is very interesting. It looks like most of this chassis might be held together by pins and rivets. And see, I see a seam around here where the gearbox might be put together, but I don't want to break it either. Feels like it's turning smoothly though, so I don't know, maybe I can just clean it up and give it some fresh oil. Well, it definitely needs some fresh oil, making it sound like that. Yeah, I don't see any way to take these trucks apart, so the only possibility is these four little heads here. Those aren't screws, but those might be pins of some sort. But I need to get inside to clean these up, so I think I'll just have to maybe break those. I'll start right here since I've got that piece I can work from. See if I can pry that off. It's not quite working, is it? Hmm. Oh, you know what? It did start to pry up that pin a little bit. So in that case... Aha! So there it is. It's one of these little pins that has sort of a threading to it, so as you press it in, it kind of grips into the metal, and bites into it. And that helps to hold things in place. So that means I should be able to start the other one like that and pry it up. Yes, okay. All right. So that means I don't have to break it, which is preferable. All right, that's all four pins. Plate lifts off, side frames lift out, and there's the inside. So it looks like the worm and axle gears are all metal. So that's good. Some quality in there. I was expecting those gears to be made from all plastic. 
Got to get that shaft out. There's just that little snap ring on the back. So carefully pry that up and off. So this is built a lot like the Varney drives from the same time. So yeah, I think this was made in assistance with, with Varney or in conjunction with Varney. All right. So that's how to get the truck apart. And as for how it's held to the frame, I see the end of a screw there. So yeah, they definitely screwed down into there and then soldered a wire onto the top of it. Now, don't wanna mess anything up there, so. Just tighten that up a little bit and leave it alone. But with that, the inside of the truck is actually pretty clean. There's just a little bit of old factory grease left in there and that's it. So this has definitely never been opened up before. And it seems like it was pretty well sealed against whatever flood this apparently went through. So that's all a good sign. A lot of tarnish on these wheels. That'll be easy enough to clean up. I can buff that out. And the gears look like they're in really good shape. So yeah, just a little cleaning on this and some fresh grease. And I think that'll be ready to go. Start out by brushing some of that out. Wipe some oil away. There isn't much, so that also makes it easy. So that axle already looks pretty clean. So I think all I really need to do is get rid of that tarnish on the wheels. And yeah, it is uh, one wheel grounded to the axle, and the wipers just uh, kind of help to improve that little bit, and maybe also help to keep the treads clean as it's running along. So clean that up. I'll just put this new buffing wheel onto my Dremel. Get a bit of compound on there. And then get to work. That works fast. All right, then just wipe away any residue from the buffing process. Ow. Try not to burn myself on the hot metal. So there's one axle done. Five more to go. Okay, so to clean up the gearbox, I decided to just give it a little bath in 99.9% .9 alcohol and brush it clean. And that seems to have done a really good job. So that was easy to clean out. And then I also cleaned up the gear on the motor. So I'll just go ahead and put the gearbox back in there along with the motor and we'll give that a little fresh oil and see how it works. Tight. We'll be right there. And screw that down. Yeah, that all seems to be well meshed and turning properly. Okay, 
Okay, that should do it for oil. And then a little bit of fresh grease. Just work that through a little bit. Okay, these gears are nylon, so they don't really need much grease. Just enough to make them a little bit more slippery. Let's power this up real quick and see if that motor works. It's trying. Oh, there it goes. Looks like both of the lights work too. Seems like that actually works pretty well. Current draw is pretty high though. That's drawn about 0.6 amps right now, or just a little bit above. And the mechanism and all turns freely enough, so yeah, I think some of that might just be from some of it might be from these light bulbs. Yeah. These lights each draw about maybe 0.15 amps, almost 0.2, so at least a quarter of an amp is going to these light bulbs. Yeah, that drops the current to just a quarter of an amp from the motor. So these light bulbs use a lot of power. But, at least now I know that the central mechanism is working really well. It's got a nice running motor too. Okay, I'll just uh, get the rest of the wheels done and clean up those trucks. Okay, so the wheels are clean, but there is still some tarnish and in one case at least a little bit of um, rust residue around one of the wheels. So I'm just gonna clean up the sides real quick with a wire wheel. Just be gentle with that. This won't buff them to a high shine or anything. I'm just getting them cleaned up a little bit. Yeah, that looks good. I'll do the same for the rest of them real quick. Now as for the worm shaft here, I should just be able to wipe off most of what's on there. Yeah, just a bunch of old grease on that shaft and in the worms. All I've got to do is just uh, go through them like this. I just kind of get my nail into there and then Carve through it with the paper towel. And that takes most of the grease out. So that's a quick and easy way to clean these things up. And then if there's anything left over in there, I can just give it a quick brushing out like that. Should be all good to go. Then the truck frame can be easily cleaned out using a Q-tip. Just kind of stick that through there. You can get the other bits of grease through here. Since there isn't much there anyway, this is a pretty easy cleanup. I don't need to get all of the old grease out. Just enough to not gum things up. And then these contacts here, I think they need a quick buffing. Now 
And that looks a lot better. Okay. As long as the trucks are apart, I think now would be a good time to go ahead and take the shell and all that up for cleaning. I'll take the railings off just so that nothing gets broken along the way. And the end railings are metal, so I'm going to leave them on. I'm only taking off the sides. Okay, now take the shell and the side frames up to the sink for some cleaning. Okay, so to clean this up, I'll just uh, soak it in a little bit of warm water here. A little bit of soap on there. And then just scrub that gently with a toothbrush. Just have to be real thorough with it to make sure it gets all the dirt out of the shell. Sometimes I have to, when they're really dirty, I'll have to go over it a couple times. Let's see how this one turns out though. A lot of times the dirt is sort of hidden until the shell is dried out, so... Just to finish this first scrubbing. And give it some time to dry and we'll see how it looks. Okay, that should do for the first scrubbing. that off. Sometimes it also helps to scrub a little bit more while you're rinsing. All right, so that's all nice and clean now. So I'll just do the same for the uh, truck side frames. Let's set that out to dry. Now to reassemble that truck, just stick that back through there. Add some fresh oil. A couple drops around there. And one more in here. Then the axles. This way. So the insulated wheels on the side opposite from the wiper. And the cleaned up side frames right here. Add a little more oil for the axles. And some grease for each of those gears. Just a little blob on each one. And that looks good. And just put that uh, plate back on there. And shove these pins down into those holes. Make sure those hold tightly. They probably won't be as tight as when they were new, so if they start to come out, I'll just put a little drop of glue onto each one, but I think as long as I can kind of squeeze them into there, they should be fine. You can try squeezing them down with pliers like this. Actually, I might just have to prop this up onto a block or something and tap those down. Okay, I've got a working system figured out. Just had to prop it up right and put a pin on it, which is actually just this uh, wire wheel, of course. Then 
lets me tap it down. There, now the pins are nice and tight. So all that leaves is the snap ring. It goes right here. Okay. All right, so I've got both of the trucks reassembled, but before I reinstall the shafts, I want to get the couplers mounted. So the originals are long gone. I think I can tap these holes out for some 256 screws. So I'm just going to give that a try, see how that goes. Let's get a little bit at a time. Yeah, it looks like that's going through. Okay. Yeah, I checked these um, truck mounted boxes already and they look like they're at the right height for standard KD couplers. So I've got some number fives ready to go. Once I've got these threads tapped, I should just be able to screw them in there. I'll just trim these sides off. Don't need that. And normally the Centering spring for the number five goes on top of the coupler, but in this case, I think it'll work fine underneath. Okay, that looks good. And if there's any interference with the body, I can trim off the end of that screw. Okay, now with the couplers in place, I just need to put these universals back in. And the other one. Okay, so there's the assembled chassis. Let's give that a track test real quick before I put the body on. All right, let's see how that does. Starts right up. Running along smoothly too. Quite a bit of gear noise, of course. Yeah, that's a really smooth runner. High current draw. Of course, I can knock off about a quarter of an amp at least by replacing those light bulbs with something more efficient. Yeah, this is turning out really nice. Okay, let's see if the body fits on there without any trouble. And it looks like it's going to be just fine. I do have to get that tab in place, though. There we go. Okay, there and there. And the screw that goes in the front. Okay. Yeah, it looks like the screws are going to interfere with the shell. See, I'll trim those down a little bit and then put that back on. There we go, that's better. Well, the trucks can swivel freely under there without interference. And the body keeps the trucks from swinging too far for their shafts to fall out. So all that's left is to put these handrails back in. I haven't decided what I want to do with them yet exactly, if I want to repair them or come up with some replacements. So for now, I'll just leave them as they are. I brushed off a little bit of dirt. So that goes in there. Yeah, so the railings on here aren't really in the best of shape, but that is the reassembled model. And the paint on the shell, I'd say, cleaned up pretty well, so that looks good at least. I mean, aside from just a little chip here and there, but I can probably touch that up. And I think there should be a horn here and over here. So that's another thing that I'll come up with later, I think. But for now, 
the model is ready to run. Yeah. So yeah, the handrails aren't really in great shape and it looks like both of the horns that are supposed to be there are broken off. But it cleaned up well overall. The chassis runs well. The paint looks good aside from just a little chip here and there, which I can probably find a way to touch up and repair. So with that, I think the model is as far done as I'm going to do for this video. Now for the review portion of the video, I think I'll start off talking about the detail of the model, which as you can see is definitely not the best out there, even for its time. It does largely capture the dimensions of the DL600 accurately, which I'll at least give it that much, but of course a lot of the details are kind of poorly scaled. The most obvious detail that has scaling issues would be the ventilation here, which has screens inside, but as you can see, they are way, way oversized on the mesh. Um, like comparing to Athern and other plastic models from the same time, it's pretty obvious that they could have done this much better. They just didn't, likely for cost savings. And it ends up making it look pretty toy-like from the side view. And for the screens on top, it's the same issue of very obvious um, oversized scaling on the mesh, so that really doesn't look realistic, gives it a real toy-like appearance. And also the vent on the side, which has very little detail to it. The scaling issues continue to the front, where you can see that the grab irons, even though they're really thick, are actually um, pretty obviously undersized compared to any photos you'll see. And the headlights seem to be a bit oversized and pretty chunky looking. And they're also missing the grab irons that should have been on the side here. So some details are out of scale, others are just missing. When you get to the pilot, it's just flat and open to make room for the swinging truck mounted coupler. And they've got those pins holding the steel handrail to the front. As for the trucks, they're very flat, as you can see, have very little detail to them. The Springs are just little lines in the sides, and there's really no depth to the side frames at all. And comparing to others that were made around the same time or even years before this, um, they're very um, poorly scaled. I mean, they're at least the correct size and have the correct axle spacing, but they could have done a lot better here. Now, the quality of the paint is also not so great. It's heavy. The uh, lines and separation are fuzzy in the best of areas. Printing for the Alco in 430 is okay, at least. But the rest of the paint around here, there's really no um, clear, sharp line around. And around there, you can even see that the lines didn't even meet up. So, yeah, definitely not the best painting. And again, other models from the same time were already doing this better, so... Um, this really seems to be something that was made pretty much to be cheap and kind of a starter model for people just getting into the hobby, I'd say, or for possibly for kids who are getting interested in the hobby. But it's definitely not a serious scale model, even for its day. Well, even though it may not be a great model for detail, it is at least a good running model. It takes off reliably. Runs pretty smoothly, too. Really just about as smoothly as really any mass-produced model I've seen from this time period. It is loud, though. The shell really amplifies that central gearbox. Getting up to full speed it's definitely where it gets loudest. I measured that to be 109 scale miles per hour at the top speed. And it draws about three quarters of an amp. And as I mentioned before, a quarter of an amp is going just to the light bulb, so replacing those will drop that quite a bit. It's noisy at all speeds, but it's at least tolerable when you get down to lower freight speeds like this, so I think that's about where I would keep it. I might experiment with replacing the gear transfer 
at some point with the belt transfer to quiet it down. That should work pretty well too. Low speed control, I was actually surprised. It's not bad. It runs pretty steady, as long as electrical pickup can be maintained, and down to the motor's minimum sustainable speed. And that's about six scale miles per hour. So yeah, it actually does pretty well for its running quality. Aside from the noise, I really can't fault it. 12-wheel drive gives it plenty of traction. Six-wheel electrical pickup means it's going to be a, at least a little more reliable than other models that had four-wheel pickup, which was common at the time. And since the wheels are all metal, it also gets good traction from that. Unlike plastic wheels typically got, they were a little more slippery. And of course, the truck mounted couplers, they're going to keep the freight cars from getting dragged off on tight turns, even though they do make it look quite a bit less realistic. Now, the weight of the model, I would say, is pretty average for a plastic one. It's uh, about 12 and a half ounces, 12.3 ounces there, so. Nothing really heavy, but since it does have those brass wheels, that helps to make up for some of the uh, loss of traction from reduced weight. But even with that, it's going to have plenty of power for pulling a long load. So I wouldn't consider the um, lighter weight of the model to be an issue. And speaking of pulling trains, this does so with complete ease. The motor has plenty of power behind it even enough to slip the wheels. So it's gonna have no problem at all taking off with even a longer load of freight cars behind it. Of course, what I have here isn't even close to what it would be able to pull with the amount of traction it has. But I think that's a pretty good looking number of freight cars to go with an engine like this. Or maybe even about 20 cars. Bounces over the switches a little bit. But overall, it really is a very smooth, powerful runner. So yeah, again, maybe not the best model for detail, but if what you're looking for is just some good, rugged, running quality, this will definitely do the job. So this is an overall interesting piece of vintage HL scale equipment. And on top of that, it's a very, very rarely modeled um, diesel engine in HL scale. The only other ones I know of are brass, either from Overland models, possibly from Alco Brass KMT. So these are very hard to find, and this is the only plastic model you're going to be finding for a long time, I think. Of course, Broadway Limited, they produced the very similar Alco RSD-15 in HO scale, and that is a much better model all around. Of course, those also cost quite a bit more, being hundreds of dollars, but then you get a ton of detail, sound, and all that other good stuff. And for a similar price, you can also... Um, often find the key Sam Hongsa model of the RSD-15 for a similar price to the BLI one, and those are even a little step up in detail. But if you're wanting an inexpensive plastic model, this isn't a bad option. I mean, a lot of the details that are on here, if you're willing to do some work, you can cut them out, replace them, sand them down, and make this into really an all right looking model. Give it a repaint. So these would be good for custom projects, I think. Or if not for custom projects, if you maybe have a large layout where you tour, let people tour around, this might be a good one to let the kids run around because it is a durable, rugged, and easy to handle model that would be um, well suited to them. And with the all-metal gearing in the trucks, as well as the open-frame motor and just heavy-duty gearing and other parts all around, this is going to stand up well for a long time to 
a lot of running and as, as well as wear and tear and whatever abuse might come towards them. So yeah, you can put this on the track, pull long loads, and it's gonna do just fine, I think. So I've seen these going for anywhere from about 50 to $100, so maybe not the cheapest models you can get. I got this one for about 50 just because of the flood damage. But again, considering the um, only other plastic model you can get is gonna cost about three, four times more than this, I think it's about the best value you're gonna find if you want one of these in HO scale. Now, these are also sold under the American Flyer name, like on eBay and swap meets and stuff, even though they were originally sold as Gilbert, who was American Flyer's owner. So sometimes they'll pop up under that brand instead of Gilbert. So that's one other way to find them if you're interested in getting one.